So I have a background in uh, biological and cognitive psychology, pretty technical story about the brain. Then I did a PhD in cognitive neuroscience. And uh, now I'm a co-founder and the principal scientist at Alpha One. Uh, we're a consumer neuroscience company. So we do commercial based neuroscience. I'm also a faculty member at Singularity University uh, at, uh, from Silicon Valley. Um, so why is he talking this fast? It's because I've only got 20 minutes. Some people say more is less. But hopefully you'll agree with me when it's about knowledge that doesn't count. So I'm going to go and make a neuro train this coming 20 minutes. No questions, questions afterwards. Uh, let's go to the first example. Yeah. So this is um, one of the techniques we like to use in our lab is called EEG. The big advantage of this technique is that you can measure per millisecond how much attention does the brain have for a certain stimuli, for example. So this is what we call a, a JIP and Jenica simple neuroscience study. So these are males and females. They have uh, the EEG connected. Um, and they're looking at a TV screen in a random order of shoes and motorcycles. So if I would ask you to answer, is this a motorcycle or a shoe that you're looking at, it will take you approximately 300 milliseconds. So that's pretty impressive. A third of a second, you can push a button, shoe, motorcycle. When you're using EEG, you notice something really interesting. Because um, after 120 milliseconds, so that's way before you can consciously deliberate on your decisions, before you are consciously processing the incoming information, you see something intriguing. Uh, this difference is really pronounced at 130 milliseconds, meaning that about halfway through the process of becoming aware of the picture that you're looking at, all the female brains in this study had more attention for shoes, and in 20 men, 19 men had more attention for the motorcycles. So there was one guy who had more attention for shoes, but doesn't mention anything about the paper about him, so I continue with my point. It means that even before you're consciously aware of what you're looking at, before you have the, 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 the time to consciously deliberate, am I going to pay attention to this stimuli, your brain has already recognized the image, and more importantly, your brain is making decisions for you. So what we do is we focus on how this brain is capable of representing incoming information in the brain, but more importantly, how is this incoming information valued and how does it lead to, to decision making? So in this example, I showed you that your brain is really fast at processing information and it tends to make decisions for you. Um, and I'm going to demonstrate that for you now. So you need to have a good view of the screen. So it's a bit tilted, so I hope this will work. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you two pictures. These are portrait pictures of US congressional election candidates. So they're runner-up candidates. They are competing one another. Uh, I'm going to show them to you. Um, I'm going to ask you to judge the competence based on their faces. So try to focus on their faces. Uh, it's going to be really fast. So you have half a second to judge competence from two faces. And then we're going to do an election here in half a second and see whether that makes a big difference or not. Yes? Everybody's with me? Here we go. OK, that's really fast. <laughs> Let's do some voting. Who thinks that person is the more competent? There's not a lot. Who thinks that person is the more competent? So here you see you have a consensus in about half a second of about 90% with a preference for one of the two people. And interestingly, you also correctly predicted the outcome of the election. So they started to investigate this in 2005 for the first time. They used one second. As it turns out, we with an audience here who have never seen these people before, and they've been able to reduce the time necessary to judge competence from faces from one second to just 100 milliseconds. And in 100 milliseconds, we can correctly predict US election outcomes more than 70% of the times correctly. 
that should be a shock for your brain. Because let me ask you a question. The last time you voted for a particular candidate, try to elaborate for yourself why you elected that person. Because now inside your brain, your modern parts of the brain are producing intelligent sounding stories. I'm not saying that these stories are untrue, they're just not the entire story. There are other processes occurring here, and afterwards we never mention the influence of the, how this, this phase is characterized and how it influences your preferences. And let's, let's note that this is a high involvement decision. You have months to make up your mind. There's a lot of information to base your judgment on. And still, we are influenced by really ancient parts of the brain. Let me ask you another question. You, know, you had half a second to reach a consensus of 90%. It means it should be really easy to pinpoint what it is and how these phases are built that's causing this preference inside you. So let's shout a few things. What do you think it is? Anyone? Sorry? Skin color. Um, it is a bias, yes, but these guys have got the same skin color in this case, yeah. Uh, smiling is important if you want to sell something, not necessarily for competence. Everybody has eyes, I mean. Sorry? The shoulders are higher. And that's better or worse or? I think we could go on for like 30 minutes. I tried it once and nobody guessed it. There was a study in the US. They looked at mouth size in men. Um, it turns out yeah, when we were chill chimpanzees, uh, the bigger the mouth of the male, you can show your fangs. It's easier to show your dominance. And then they looked at, well, is that still a factor today? So they checked the mouth size of the Fortune 500 company CEOs. And yes, they found a correlation. The bigger the mouth of the CEO, the more successful people think they are. It's in relation to your head, so if you have a really big head, it doesn't help. But remarkably, the bigger the size of the mouth of the CEO, the better the organization performs in terms of financial results. And that was a little bit shocking. So we did our own investigation here in the Netherlands. Uh, we looked at the politicians. So here we have... Um, Mark Rutte and Buma, we took all the male leaders and all the, the, the female leaders, eight, eight males, eight females. This is the original picture. And here we use Photoshop to reduce the mouth size just 10%. And here we increase mouth size with 10%. And then we asked 600 Dutch voters to uh, elaborate, to judge the competence of these politicians. Intriguingly, we already know these politicians and still we could find a causal significant relationship in, only in the males. So for females, the success of females is, is not related to the size of their mouth. <laughs> well, we should test some other variables, but that's not a study. It shows that for males, the bigger the mouth size, maybe we should put the mic a little bit down, uh, the bigger the mouth size, the more successful we think they are. I think that's intriguing because we don't realize that these factors are still playing a critical role today. So, um, how is that possible? If you look at the evolution of the brain, so here we see a fish brain, a reptile, a bird, but this is 300 million years of evolution. There's not a lot happening here inside the brain. Uh, but then we have here uh, a rat brain, a monkey brain, and a human brain. This is only, but only 30 million years of evolution, 10% of this period. And you can see that this neocortex, the modern parts of the brain, they're growing at a fantastic rate. But what's interesting, if I would be able to lift up this neocortex from its brainstem, what we find underneath is what we still like to call the ancient brain or the reptilian complex. So, for example, we see an amygdala. We also have an amygdala. We measure it with the brain scanning consumers while they're watching TV commercials so we can judge the emotional arousal during the campaign. So they're basically performing similar functions in humans, but we can trace back these regions and these structures in the brain back till frogs. So the idea is that some parts of our brain are about 500 million years old. So in a sense, we are equipped with an old brain and a modern brain, and these two compete to produce behavior. 
But intriguingly, because whatever happens in the ancient brain is outside of your control and mostly outside of your awareness, is that we tend to overestimate the role of the modern brain in decision making. And when you're a marketeer, you're a creative, uh, you're an entrepreneur, as a human you're always dealing with building strategic packages of information to try and persuade other people, to try and, to try and translate value in your communication. Okay. So the big idea of our field is, if you ask people to explain their behavior, for example, why did you vote for that particular candidate, we've just learned that the story is not complete. Um, so there's other information. But now that we have these modern neuroimaging techniques, the idea is if we can peek inside the brain and we can see how these more ancient reflexive processes operate on the moment when people are processing marketing stimuli, is it then true that we can better predict how consumers will behave even at an entirely different big population? Let's see. So this is an example um, published 2016. There's a store in uh, Germany, a supermarket store, and the idea is we want to sell as many chocolate bars as possible. That's usually the idea. Uh, but they had to select from six different creative ads. Um, make it a bit bigger. Let's do some conventional traditional market research here, and let's vote for the most effective picture to create chocolate sales conversions. So let's do some voting. Who says you need a nice blonde lady? See some hands? Really? Oh, okay. Who says you need a lovely couple? Yeah. Who says you need to break the chocolate bar? It's usually the most popular one. Maybe this one? This one? This is the winner. And this is often the most popular picture in bigger crowds like this. But now, of course, the big question is, They've tested this with a brain scanner. So the predictions of you, the audience, as well, was not accurate. But is the brain scanner then more accurate? So here we see two regions of the brain, the nucleus accumbens. It's basically the reward center of the brain. It responds to erotic stimuli, nice hamburgers, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and here we have the medial orbital frontal cortex. So these two regions are the most important drivers of these types of models. And if you look at the reward processing in the brain, it creates a sort of willingness to pay, a motivation, a desire, a sort of wanting effect. And these processes occur very fast. And intriguingly, we cannot really reflect on these processes ourselves very accurately. But as it turns out, there's a growing body of scientific evidence showing that if you not only question consumers, but you measure responses from the brain, that yes, you can better predict sales. So here we see the percentage of customers that actually bought the, truck, the chocolate. And here we see the uh, prediction of the brain scanner, functional magnetic resonance imaging. And you can see there's a pretty cool prediction from brain scanning that outperforms subjective responses in this particular case. So what's next? If you look at this picture, try to think about yourself. What do you think you are looking at? Cells. You think it's biology, right? This is actually produced by GraphCore. It's a startup from the UK, uh, and they make um, uh, graphic. Uh, 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 they make graphs of networks, and in this case, they try to use that implementation to try and show schematically what happens in an artificial brain produced by Microsoft. So this is actually a 50-layer deep learning neural net from Microsoft that has been built to recognize human faces, and remarkably. This artificial brain is better at recognizing human faces than actually we humans can recognize human faces. So what you're seeing here is neural structures that are actually um, inspired by how the human brain works. And the next step is also that we're using these types of artificial brains to start dealing with the giant amounts of big data produced by our neuroimaging machines. So in an average project, we easily have 400 million samples from brain activity computed in one statistical model. But it's child's play the way we approach it now, and these neural nets are gonna make a huge difference in the future. So for example, what you can do with these neural nets, they train themselves. 
So this is not like older machine learning techniques or decision trees. These are actually layers of neurons and they have back propagation, feed forward. They actually work very similar to how our human brain works. So you can do funny stuff with it. So this is actually a neural net that has been trained with tens of thousands of pictures. And with each picture they say it's a male, it's a female, and they, they use the age. So this is a supervised training model. So now you can upload your image and then it will tell you whether you're male or female and your age. So I'm actually 38 years old, so that's pretty damn accurate. And it just uses the pixels from your screen. So these types of neural nets, they're increase, increasingly capable of performing more naturalistic complex tasks. Um, and maybe a cool anecdote, I was two weeks ago, I was at the, at the, at the Oppie trying to get a six pack and they asked me for my ID. Uh, <laughs> so you have to be 18 to get a beer, so yes. <laughs> but what's cool is, and what we're working on uh, behind the scenes, is that we're using actually these neural nets uh, to start using them to predict where people will watch in images. So we just take eye tracking data, we upload it to the neural net, and we show them where people would be looking at, at the pictures, and then the neural nets can reproduce that with an accuracy of about 85% meaning that you don't need to rent uh, 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 subjects from a consumer panel, invite them to the lab, uh, get data for a week. You can simply upload your picture, for example, your website. This will give you a pretty good estimate of where people will be watching. And this is a neural net uh, produced by MIT. Uh, it was also trained to recognize the memorability of a picture. And the memorability performance of this artificial brain is also near human performance. So it can predict where people will watch, and it can also predict how memorable the, uh, memorable the, the picture uh, is. So these types of neural nets are also used to analyze neuroimaging data. So I already explained to you, um, when we use a functional magnetic resonance imager, there are about 10,000 spots in the brain where we, take, uh, where we measure the activity. <coughs> And each of these 10,000 spots, they have a time series. But these different voxels, they talk to each other, different regions have different functions, etc. So if you have these much more complex approaches in data analysis, that's much more sensitive for all these nuances and connections, you can do pretty cool stuff. So this is a lab, sorry, from Berkeley. Uh, uh, Professor Jack Gallant's working here with machine learning techniques to analyze activity in the visual cortex. So for this study, uh, people were lying inside a brain scanner uh, and they were watching different video clips. It lasted for about three hours. So you need three hours of brain activity to train this machine learning technique to recognize and connect. If this is the incoming visual input, then this is the accompanying pattern of neural activity in the visual cortex. Step two is, Okay, we put somebody else inside the brain scanner, we show them different video clips, and then, is it possible to build a visual reconstruction based on neural activity of the brain? And if we use these machine learning techniques to build such visual reconstructions, what would it look like? So this is actually a video clip, and I'm going to start it for you. So again, this is the input, and this is the machine learning technique that uses neural activity in the visual cortex to try and reconstruct what the person inside the brain scanner is watching. So there have been uh, examples, they've trained an, an, a machine learning technique to, to recognize uh, a number between zero and 10. I think they're now at about 85% accurate, so you're lying inside a brain scanner, think about a number between zero and 10, and they will say you're thinking about an eight, with about 85% accuracy. So this is moving towards actual mind reading, and not simply taking some biomarkers from the brain. There's also been studies where people have been put to sleep, and you can extract images and associations from your dreams. Whether that's something that you want uh, is, is actually up to you. Um, so what I'm trying to tell you is that when people reflect on the way they make decisions, we can never be able to reflect on the complete story because there are many processes occurring outside your awareness, outside your control. So now we have these neuroimaging techniques and we can trace how these processes operate 
reflexively on the moment when people are processing these types of stimuli. So without even asking what people are thinking about these types of stimuli. Um, and we're already making huge progress on this, on this moment. So most of the big consumer brands in the Netherlands, we've already started working with them. So you can think about telecom companies, insurance companies, banking companies, Motagama, National in Nederland. All these companies are using these techniques to optimize their TV commercials, but also optimize movie trailers, complete TV content, TV shows, etc. Um, so maybe. The payoff, uh, uh, the take home message is try and read Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. That's like an important next step to understand how we have different processes. And it will be important for you if you're a creative, marketer, salesperson. I don't know what, you, what you're doing. It, this is the new important information. So you have system one, it's really fast, automatic reflexive, it's always on, it tends to be a bit naughty and jump to conclusions. And we have no introspection. And system two is very slow, that's your modern brain. Controlled, it's not always on. And we say it's a bit lazy, it doesn't want to be on. Uh, but we have introspection. So this config configuration causes the effect that we tend to overestimate the role of this layer when we try to describe human behavior. How's the timing? Perfect. That's it, thank you.